Good. So, good evening once again to everyone here, but also everyone joining on live stream. <laughs> it's really weird to feel that you're being live streamed, but you sort of get used to it after a while. And it's really lovely afterwards to hear that people do listen in and benefit as well. So, it's great. The Dhamma should be accessible. The Dhamma is universal and the Dhamma goes out to all those who need it. So hopefully there'll be something in this evening's talk that will be helpful also. So I like to set myself up with difficult topics, it seems. <laughs> and so this evening's talk is called What is Wisdom? And uh, I'm not sure I have the answers, but I can give a few suggestions and you can look in those directions and see if that speaks to you. So, of course, this is the fifth of the Indriyas. We've been looking at the five spiritual faculties or Indriyas this week, along with virtue, the first evening. And uh, wisdom is, of course, the ultimate uh, goal, in a sense, of the entire path. So even though we've talked a lot about the beauty of virtue and the joy that brings and the energy and the mindfulness and, of course, the bliss of deep stillness, the bliss of wholesome states, it's not the goal in and of itself. It's a way toward the goal. It's something that everybody will go through at some time. It's not that uh, whether you have to go through the samadhi states or not, it's just a natural inevitable part of the process because it's part of the eightfold path. But it's important to remember that the goal of the path is not those still states of mind, although of course we learn a lot about letting go, about non-self along the way. But the real goal is to develop the wisdom that removes the fetters that bind us to this cycle of birth and death. And for anybody that's a little bit ambivalent about whether birth and death is such a bad thing, remember that it's what comes between the two. If you can't remember the pain of birth, you can certainly remember probably some of the struggles of having to wear nappies and then not being able to get your nappy changed at the right time or get what you want or having a dummy shoved in your mouth and then going to school and having arguments at school or <laughs> and of course all the other sufferings that can come as a inevitable part of life and of course that increases as we age and get sick and ultimately move towards death because we have to be separated from those things that are very dear to us even if we've had the best relationships in the world or even if we've had the most wonderful meaningful life in the world it will come to an end and that's not necessarily something to feel um, you know too bad about especially if you've lived well but over time, you know, when we go through this cycle of birth and death, birth and death, it comes to a point, I think, at least it came to a point for me, <clears throat> intuitively, really, in this life, before I even heard about the Dhamma, I just thought, why am I doing all this again? You know, I really had this feeling like, do I really want to kind of do just what my parents have done and get a job and get married and, you know, have a nice career and then what? Uh, where's it actually leading me to so anyway that was a complete detraction from what I wanted to talk about but um we have to see that wisdom is something that removes suffering right so when we're saying removing the fetters these are the fetters that cause us suffering so things like doubt um attachment to rites and rituals uh and of course the view of self and then sense, desire, and ill will are the first five of these fetters. And those five are overcome in the third stage of enlightenment. So when there's no more sensual desire or ill will at all, you can't get angry. You can't really have preferences in this world. And imagine the relief of that. That doesn't mean you're somehow like less emotional or you don't live life or feel life fully. It just means that those are afflictive emotions don't trouble you anymore so you're much freer to enjoy your life and, and be of service to others so wisdom can be for two purposes it's not that wisdom only happens at the end of the path of course it does happen at a deep level as the result of samadhi samadhi pachaya yata bhutanyana dasana the buddha said which means that um, seeing things as they really are is caused by the deep stillness or the deep stillnesses, the jhanas are the cause for that clear seeing into the nature of reality. But also we can develop a lot of wisdom into the process of meditation. In other words, how meditation works and how it works to overcome the hindrances, um, how it works to 
really give us a better quality of life and bring more meaning to our lives and help us to live in more beneficial ways. It starts to purify the actions of our body, speech and mind in ways that really become a service to ourselves and others. So we start to um, use this body as a very good vehicle for doing good in this world. And of course, use our mind and our speech. So an important aspect of wisdom, of panya, the Pali word for wisdom, um, is that it's not knowledge. It's not about what we know. Yeah? It's actually experience. So it's the difference, for example, between um, hearing that rain is wet, you know, hearing that rain is kind of when it lands on you, it's sort of a bit tickly or a bit cold and actually experiencing the rain, going out into the rain and experiencing that rain on your face. How does that feel? It's a direct experience that can be known to you. Ajahn Brahm has a nice little phrase that I found actually after contemplating this. He says, wisdom is not learning but seeing clearly what can never be taught. So it is yours, it's your personal experience. It's not that the Buddha can't suggest the direction in which to look, because obviously we need teachers to give us another perspective and to give us a sense of which way to incline the mind, but it can't be taught in the sense that nobody can plant that wisdom in your head. It has to arise from a result of clear seeing. And I was thinking about this even further and talking with a very close Dhamma sister. And she said, I think you can't even say wisdom and insight are the same. You can have insight into the three characteristics. You can have insight into suffering, impermanence and non-self. But it only becomes wisdom when those insights transform the mind. Until it's really integrated, we can't really call it wisdom. It has to have an effect on our lives. There has to be a consequence of those insights to make it really wisdom. And that integration can take time. It has to kind of percolate, you know, through the body and mind and become um, a part of the way you relate to life. Yeah. Otherwise, what's the point being wise if there's no benefit for oneself and others, if it doesn't make you any happier, if it doesn't make you any more patient or kind or forgiving, then, you know, you can know so much more than even, you know, an Ajahn Brahm or, a, I don't know, Nobel Peace Prize winner, no, Nobel, isn't it? Not noble. It's much better to be a noble <laughs> prize winner if there can be such a thing. Of course, there's no prizes for becoming noble. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it has to actually have an effect and transform our lives. So in the Anguttara Nikaya, it says, uh, this is nine number three, and there are quite a few suttas that I've noted down for tonight because the Buddha is the one to ask about wisdom. Uh, so this is in Anguttara nine three. And it said, um, it says that the wisdom is the wisdom that discerns the arising and passing which is noble, penetrative, and leads to the complete destruction of suffering. Yeah, so it has to lead to the end of suffering. If it's making you more miserable, it's not really wisdom. So if you're worried about things like cessation or things like, I don't know, just hearing all the time about suffering and you're worried it's going to make things worse, then that's not really wisdom. I mean, wisdom is what actually frees and uplifts the mind. So if it's not going in the direction, it's probably still knowledge or it might even be doubt, right? It could be a misunderstanding of what the Buddha's pointing to. And also in many other places, um, you know, the Buddha talks about how seeing things in alignment with reality leads to freedom and peace. You know, he said to the first bhikkhuni, Mahapajapati Gautami, that if it's really the Dhamma, if it's really the Vinaya, it should lead to peace, deep, deep peace. It should lead to letting go. It should lead to abandoning the unskillful. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but this is the basic meaning. And it should lead to things starting to fade and cease. And this is a gradual, um, almost like a gradual refinement of peace. It's not that one minute you're peaceful and the next minute things have ceased. That cessation is just a deeper peace than the one you've experienced before. Because if you look very closely at what peace is, it's not actually something that's there. It's the lack of suffering, isn't it? It's the lack of agitation in the mind. It's the lack of 
an impingement on the senses, right? There's peace because something that was causing you trouble, something that was oppressive has now started to calm down. And the more things come, the more peace we experience. So how do we develop wisdom is the most important question, I think. And um, I wanted to just mention the two causes for stream winning, because there's two very important causes for um, the first breakthrough to real insight that starts to end this cycle of samsara as a stream winner, the first stage of enlightenment. And the first one is, again, spiritual friendship, or you could call it wise friendship, association with the wise. And so we're already incredibly fortunate to be here because we're all sitting in a retreat with definitely one person that I can tell you for sure is very wise. And I wouldn't speak like that about myself. <laughs> I don't think anyone would speak like that about themselves. Um, but I have a lot of confidence, you know, that I'm hearing the Dhamma not just from somebody who understands it intellectually through what they've read and what they've learned, but somebody who has actually imbibed the teachings and transformed themselves at a very, very deep level and had those insights into things like non-self. And so the reason that that spiritual friendship is, as the Buddha said, the whole of the holy life is because one who has good friends in the Dhamma is bound to take steps on the path. It's inevitable that they'll start to become more virtuous, that they'll start to restrain their senses in wholesome ways, ways that actually bring more happiness for ourselves and others. And they'll naturally start to develop mindfulness and, and stillness, of, as a result of which, of course, this wisdom will arise. And so that relates to the phrase paritogosa, which is one of the first factors of stream entry, the essential factors. And it literally means the word of another. And by the word of another, it means somebody who's seen the truth because we're all conditioned, right? We're all completely conditioned. I mean, there isn't even a we or an I that is conditioned. It's just what we're seeing manifest is a whole heap of conditioned processes. It's not that you're not there, right? Because there is an arising of these processes. It's just that we wrongly, um, what's the word? Um, appropriate it as a being or as a self so we're appropriating something that is not self as self it doesn't mean there's nothing there but we need the word of somebody who's seen this to put that idea in our head so to speak so that if we do get into these deep states of stillness there is a chance that we'll look in the right direction and again, another Dhamma friend told me a, a lovely simile. They said, it's like if you're going into the forest and before you go into the forest, somebody says, oh, in the forest, you might see a squirrel. You know, even look out, be on the lookout for a squirrel. And if they say that to you, you're more likely to see a squirrel than somebody who isn't on the lookout for one, right? So it's not that you're imagining what you're seeing. It's not that because it's been suggested that there's a squirrel, you're just imagining a squirrel in the trees it's just that you're actually on the lookout for one and you know that it has a significance and a meaning you know maybe it's important to see this squirrel for some reason <laughs> obviously you know well maybe if you can see that squirrel as dukkha anicca and anatta is impermanent and non-self but uh you can actually see suffering in little beings they look cute and fluffy but have you seen how nervous they are you know always looking around to see if anything's coming for them uh, a bit of a sad story came to mind but I'll spare you because it was a bit horrible but a squirrel basically got chased by a uh what do you call it a greyhound I was with Ajahn Brahm at the time and we both thought this greyhound was really nervous because it was trembling and we were like oh poor thing but actually it was excited to go and chase this squirrel and it actually got hold of the poor thing that was really interesting because we both looked at each other and said, hmm, there's an example of like our mistaken perception because we were feeling like this poor dog, so nervous. But actually it was really, um, what do you call, charged up with the kind of thrill of the anticipated chase. So that was very sad. But anyway, I didn't really think to bring that up about the poor little squirrel. But if we, <laughs> if we do know what to look out for, we're more likely to look in that direction. And that is one reason that spiritual friendship is so important. And then the second factor of stream winning, equally important, is yoni so manasikara, which means like the work of the mind or awareness or attention, 
that goes back to the source of things, that looks right into the source, where things are arising from. So it's not only that we see arising and passing. I mean, that's kind of easy to see if we, especially if we train our perception to see that in a very subtle way, we can see the arising and passing of all kinds of mental and physical processes. But it's also understanding how they arise and how they cease what leads to their arising, what leads to their cessation. So this is kind of, it can be insight either into the process of meditation, these things can happen, you know, long before jhana, you can start having a feeling about how things arise and pass. Or it can also be at a much deeper level, you know, when the mind is free from hindrances and you can see things literally just ceasing and fading away. An example of uh, seeing that in just ordinary practice can be, you know, in working with things like, for example, sadness or feelings of hopelessness or an emptiness inside. Somebody was talking about that yesterday. And I think, you know, we all experience these emotions from time to time. And, uh, you know, we can we can sense in to the felt um, energy, if you like, of those emotional states and actually locate them in the body or get in contact with their um, manifestation. So we're seeing the arising, we're seeing how they manifest. But also, I don't know if you've noticed this, sometimes it can lead to certain thoughts that are kind of in attunement with that energy that you feel. So if there's a sort of sadness, then all the thoughts that come up as a consequence are also tainted with sadness. You know, it's all the sad thoughts about things that have gone wrong and why things will never go right again and how it's going to be in the future, looking at things in a very sort of sad and lonely way and that builds the feeling that builds the emotion yeah so we're actually fabricating our experience at that point whereas when we just stay present we just stay open even with a feeling of gentle embracing of that emotion gen gentle tender care then <clears throat> this emotional energy or if you like sankara right it's a conditioned response to something that's arising starts to lose its power and it starts to dissipate a little bit because we're not fueling it with our craving and our aversion we're not trying to get rid of it or make something out of it or believe in those thoughts we have about it and around it and so we can see I mean this is a sort of very simple example to use about how we can start to see the arising of things and what fuels them what keeps them going and what starts to undermine them in a way that leads again to peace it should always be leading to peace not straight away you know we have to be patient there's again this patience or gentle persistence if you like gentle perseverance i think it's a very similar thing i think the difference is probably that patience just stays with something and the perseverance has that sense of coming back again and again you know you don't give up because you know it hasn't worked so far you keep on returning to something again and again again and again yeah not necessarily in the meditation, but of course it can happen in the meditation, but also say if you are trying to practice in your daily life and it's uh, difficult to do so, you keep on trying, you know? Okay, well, I managed uh, five minutes today. It's not very much, but I'll turn up again tomorrow and I'll give it another go, you know? Or even I missed it all week. Doesn't matter, you haven't failed. You can always start again. So gentle persistence is very important as well. So there was another question that came up earlier, and I wanted to speak to that a little bit, because I do think that wisdom can uh, really help us on the way into samadhi as well, not only as a consequence of that deep meditation. And for myself, I practiced a lot with the so-called vipassana practices, um, which you know, you could say it's not different from samatha, but the object is slightly different. So instead of making breath my main focus, my main focus was the perception of arising and passing away. So when I'd experienced sensations in the body, yes, I experienced sensations just as we've been doing, but my main, my perception was tuned to pick up the impermanent nature of those sensations. So it's just a slightly different way of looking at them. And this really led to um, a lot of very helpful insights that helped to make my life a lot more uh, steady, 
it increased my equanimity, especially for things that, you know, would have otherwise disturbed me in the past. It increased a sense of resilience, of metta, of patience, of forgiveness, because I could see that, you know, nothing is really solid. Everything is changing all the time. And, uh, and yet at the same time, at a certain point in my practice, I realized after meditating probably about 15 years and intensively, not just, you know, one or two 10 day retreats a year, but like most of the year or all of the year after I ordained and every day. And, you know, I was constantly aware of this uh, arising and passing nature of the mind and the body. The, the mind a little bit less wasn't completely clear to me, but there was definitely an inference there that was, you know, everything's arising and passing. But it's still at the same time, it reached a kind of plateau. And I felt like I couldn't quite go beyond that. It's like, yes, it's all arising and passing. But when is that arising and passing going to end? <laughs> That might sound a bit sort of strange and technical, but I guess what I realized at that time is that, yes, you can get very far in the practice without the jhana states, with a different kind of samadhi that's very tuned into the wisdom aspect of reality. But at a certain point, it's hard to go further. And that was when enter Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> so I heard his teachings on uh, some CDs from the early rains retreat talks that he used to give in the late 90s and clearly he had had some very deep insights and uh, the talks were completely no jokes, <laughs> very deep, very straight dhamma and very powerful indeed and uh, it just confirmed to me that having that extra tool of samadhi is like sharpening the blade of a knife. You know, you can cut your vegetables with a blunt knife and it will work eventually to get you enlightened, but <laughs> maybe. Um, but if the knife is really sharp, then it cuts through just so much more easily. And so to have those two aspects to the practice is very, very helpful indeed. And uh, it may well be best to practice the samadhi first, I think because it's important to encourage ourselves with these beautiful, wholesome states and the pleasure that that affords. It makes it easier, I think, for many people then to, um, to in a sense, cope with those deep insights that arise because you realize it's not going to uh, break you in any way. It's not going to leave you bereft of anything that's very valuable to you. It's actually going to um, enable you to let go of suffering. <laughs> you know and you and the more you practice the more peace and joy and selfless peace selfless kind of joy you will experience yeah states like loving kindness and compassion altruistic joy and equanimity as well so it's like the deeper the samadhi the deeper the wisdom the deeper the wisdom the deeper the samadhi so that in that sense these two things uh roll around each other and increase and deepen one another so also, uh, I wanted to just go into the last little part of the sequence that we talked about yesterday, because yesterday we spoke about um, the beautiful happiness that can arise on the way into the jhanas. And today I want to just talk about the next sequence again, that um, the samadhi is the proximate cause for seeing things as they really are. Yeah. So again, it's not just for blissing out. It's not just for a peaceful abiding, although that can be a great relief and a very nourishing and insightful experience in and of itself. But there's a kind of consequence to that and almost a responsibility to then use that very powerful mind to look in the right direction and go a little bit further. And so one of the suttas I've noted down talks about what to do after getting into deep meditation based on the Brahma Viharas, like metta. So let's take loving kindness as the example here. So the Buddha talks about spreading loving kindness in all directions, you know, to the north, south, east and west, maybe up and below, and just spreading it everywhere because the mind at this point is liberated from all aversion and it's basically in a complete state of loving kindness, unconditional love and care for the world and all beings, obviously. But then he says that one should reflect, and this is in the Majjhima Nikaya 52, number, uh, paragraph eight. He says that this deliverance of mind through loving kindness is conditioned and volitionally produced. 
but whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent and subject to cessation. If one is steady in this, they attain the destruction of the taints, which basically means all the defilements. Okay. So even with states like loving kindness and other jhanas based on loving kindness or that you enter through the breath meditation, whatever your object of meditation is, we have to recollect afterwards that they're conditioned. They're not permanent. They still are going to pass away. As Ajahn said earlier, you know, it's not a reliable resting place. You've not gone far enough yet. There's still a little more to do. So it's a temporary freedom. It's a temporary release and a very, very powerful one. But still, isn't it good to know there's more? <laughs> I think it's a good thing. So um, another one that I wanted to read to you, and this is maybe a little more challenging, is uh, another recollection we can do after jhana practice. And so this is from the Majjhima Nikaya number 64, the Maha Malunkya Putta Sutta. And this is in the context of having practice jhana meditation whether it's the four jhanas or also the immaterial um, immaterial attainments as well so the buddha says whatever exists therein of feeling perception formations and consciousness one sees those states as impermanent as suffering as a disease as a tumor, as a barb, as a calamity, as an affliction, as alien, as disintegrating, as void and as not self. So this might sound very negative, but the next bit shows that it's not. So then, because you've seen all that unsatisfactoriness in the world of the body and the mind, one turns their mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless element, which basically means Nibbana. And one understands this is the peaceful. This is the sublime. That is the stilling of all formations, the relinquishment of all attachments or acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, Nibbana. So this is very powerful because we're not just giving up something really good for something rubbish. It's the opposite. We're giving up the inferior for the superior. And we can experience that in our practice. It doesn't suddenly change course, you know, just because the word like cessation comes in. It's still on the same trajectory. It's getting more and more peaceful and sublime. It's just that we can't quite understand this in terms of uh, in the language of a self, because we really do believe there is one. And so we get really scared when we're told that's going to disappear. But actually, if you just see it as suffering disappearing, then what is there to fear? So, I mean, this is a little bit theoretical, but I do think you can experience this in your meditation to whatever degree you meditate. You can experience at the end of the sit that there's a little bit of a lessening of tension, of distress, any time you've made peace with any experience in the mind. So the next stage after seeing things as they really are is this nibida, this kind of turning away, a kind of repulsion. You've had enough with playing around in a world that doesn't satisfy, in a world that does create suffering. Sometimes it's okay, but you know, it never really gets you very far. You know, it's ultimately kind of unsatisfactory and unreliable as well. And so this aspect of nibida basically is another response to suffering it's a response that doesn't only make peace it's the result of making peace but then it turns you away from that suffering and towards a deeper and deeper peace yeah so we can notice this in our practice we can notice that when we're blissing out and feeling joy in meditation it's not only because of the joy it's because we've turned away from suffering we've turned away from the realm of suffering right so don't forget that. And then also when you come out, you might remember, oh, yes, it's actually more agitating to start looking around or to start having all kinds of different sensory experiences. And you just kind of develop a different taste, even for things like food, you know, even food that before you really liked, like maybe really hot, spicy, like heaty food. 
suddenly feels too agitating and you prefer something a bit more gentle, a bit more like nutritious, you can experience all these subtle herbs or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, so it's just an example of how it's not a lessening of um, happiness, it's just we change our taste. And then this, of course, leads towards things fading, because if we're turning away from something, it fades from our attention, first of all. And if we ignore it for long enough, if we don't look at it for long enough, it doesn't really come back to the mind. And so suffering starts to end. You know, the next two links of viraga and niroda, that means fading away or the fuel kind of being taken away. And then niroda again, this cessation and all that ceases is suffering. Right. Just as Ajahn Brahm quoted earlier, this beautiful um, teaching by the Bhikkhuni Vajira, Vajira in uh, the early verses, the Terigata, the verses of the enlightened nuns in the Buddha's day. She said, you know, all there is, is suffering arising and suffering passing away. For me personally, that is such a relief to know. It's such a relief. And I mean, I was practicing with that perception for many, many years. And, you know, when you are really in touch with suffering arising and suffering passing away in your body and mind, you just feel like nothing matters too much. You know, nothing. <laughs> it doesn't really matter if you get what you want or if you don't get what you want. It's passing away anyway. And there's an enormous sense of freedom in that. You feel so less, um, uh, your happiness is so less dependent on external conditions. You know, you really feel like you can go anywhere, be with anyone and everything's going to be OK because you've got this stability and steadiness and equanimity inside of you. And it's just incredibly priceless. It's a kind of peace. So imagine that, you know, you don't have any worries anymore about whatever happens, whatever arises or whatever disappears. Because, you know, you have something else, you have something inside of you. Of course, for me, it's not a final thing you know, at this stage on the path, but at least I can have a sense of that. And that's very, very reassuring. So lastly, I wanted to, again, bring home the point about the impermanence of all the five khandhas, in, you know, including consciousness being not self. Um, and just point out that the Buddha is encouraging us to abandon those things, not because he wants us to suffer, but because it's going to lead to happiness. You know, in the four Satipatthanas that we've been doing with Ajahn Brahm, uh, one of the aims of those Satipatthanas is to get to the point where we understand it's just body, yeah? or it's just mind, it's just feelings, it's just mental contents. And what does that really mean? What it means is, that's all it is, it's not mine, it's not my body, it's not my feelings, it's just body, it's just feelings. Sometimes people ask, you know, well, who feels, who, who perceives? Feeling feels, Fe perception perceives, that's all. Perception has the, um, the job of perceiving, that's what it does. It's not my perception, it's just perception arising, perception passing away. And so the Buddha says, and this is in the Alagad, no, I can't say this one, Alagad, no, Alagad Upama. <laughs> it's really hard to say this one. Alagad Dupama Sutta, number 22. So, and this section is called Not Yours. So the Buddha says, bhikkhus or monastics or community, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you've abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And what is not yours? Material form is not yours, abandon it. When you've abandoned it, that will lead to your happiness and welfare for a long time. Feeling is not yours. Abandon it. Perception is not yours. Abandon it. I'm skipping a little bit here. Um, formations or sankharas, will, conditioned, um, volition, if you like, are not yours. Abandon them. When you've abandoned them, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And finally... Consciousness is not yours. Vijnana or Mano or Chitta, although it doesn't say that here, but it is one and the same. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. So this doesn't mean annihilate it. This means abandon the identification and abandon the clinging to it. 
yes abandon the clinging to it when you abandon the clinging to things then they do fade because you're not holding on to them that's why you can abandon things like the senses in deep meditation they start to fade because you're not clinging to them the minute you say oh what's happening where's my body gone the body comes back but when you don't cling to the body when you're actually really involved with the breath really really taken up with its beauty and the mind is starting to you know find delight in that breath then you realize oh well, you don't realize, <laughs> but the body disappears because you're not um, giving attention to it. And it's only when you give it attention and you remember, oh, my body, my body, what's happened to my body? That's when it reappears. So it's abandoning not the body itself, but the clinging to it. And as a result, that will leave your awareness, your field of awareness. And then finally, the Buddha says, he gives a little uh, simile. He says, if people carried off grass, sticks, branches and leaves in this jata grove or burned them or did what they liked with them, would you think people are carrying us off or burning us or doing whatever they like with us? No, venerable sir. Why not? Because that is neither ourself nor what belongs to ourself. So too, community, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you've abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And then he repeats that material form, feeling, perception, mental formations or um, volitional formations are not yours and consciousness is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. <laughs> so... I would like to end there and encourage people that this is a path of ever refining happiness and bliss and the things that we once thought were a lot of happiness are seen to be suffering. It becomes so easy and so natural to let them go. It's not scary at all. It's only when we think it's ours and we think it's important, we think it's valuable that we want to hold on. But when we have something so much more valuable, so much more reliable and peaceful and bringing of um or bestowing of compassion and kindness and goodness in the world, then, you know, you don't even have to make the volition to abandon things. It just happens naturally. Yeah. So now it is time for some meditation. Thank you. So please make your, or not your body, just make the body <laughs> comfortable because we respect these five candors even if they're not ours. Maybe it's even easier if they're not. So, abandoning the eye sense door <clears throat> temporarily, we can close our eyes. Notice the peace that arises as a result of sights fading away. Noticing the absence of sight. And the peace that brings to the mind. Noticing 
the lessening of sound. Now that the Dhamma talk has ended, and the peace between the words. The silence that surrounds us. The absence of a noisy city or a power tool, all those impingements that can happen at the ear sense door. Noticing the peace of the absence of sound. Resting in the silence between each between each word. Noticing the absence of strong smells or odors. Perhaps you've lived in places like India, where there can be so many competing smells. Garbage on the street or of incense and flowers. Noticing the peace. When the sense of smell is turned down or turned off. Noticing the absence of stimulating taste. Some tastes you enjoy. Some may be disagreeable, even repulsive to you. Noticing the peace. It arises when there's an absence of taste.
And just gently bringing your mind to the body and noticing the absence of any or many oppressive feelings. Tuning in to the subtle feelings, sensations that perhaps have arisen in their place. <laughs> or perhaps a disease that's no longer there, a headache that ceased. And allowing the mind to rest in the peace. of the absence of intense, painful sensations, a piece of subtle, peaceful, quiet feelings as the body starts to fade. It's not yours anyway. So abandon the body. Abandon any clinging to the body as me or mine. And see if instead you can notice the empty space within the mind. being contented with any amount of peace. That too is not me or mine. So just appreciating any peace that arises however long it lasts so grateful just for one moment of peace
and noticing if it arises for you, noticing the breath. the simplicity and peace of the breathing. Resting so fully with every tiny moment of the breath. We notice the end of the breath, that moment when the breath will cease before the next breath enters, pauses, and leaves. Noticing the peace in that space between the breath. Or the very subtle, quiet breath. Whatever arises is not mine. Abandoning it will lead to happiness, will lead to your welfare and peace. See if you can abandon more and more of experience and trust this process of the Dhamma.
So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. And to gently come out, you may wish to move back to the breathing, to the body sitting. to the sound of each word. Noticing the peace that has arisen and developed as things quieten down. peace that arose as other things ceased. All conditioned things are impermanent. They arise to pass away. Having arisen, they cease. And in that ceasing is the bliss of peace. So said the Buddha. And you are seeing that for yourself. Every time a little bit of softening ceases, what a great relief. So if you wish, you can gently open your eyes. I won't torture you with the sound of the gong. <laughs> it's a little bit tinny. So please, when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And uh, we have 20 minutes for questions. So inviting you to ask anything you wish, please keep it as concise as you possibly can so that many people have an opportunity, uh, unless there are no more questions. <laughs> There'll be another chance tomorrow as well. And some questions will continue in your practice and that will keep you meditating, I hope. <laughs> so anything coming? Soon. We still have a little moment of peace. <laughs> How do you like that meditation that came on the Spur of the moment. Okay.
Leah looks not happy. <laughs> Is it true? <laughs> ah. oh. <laughs> it's probably just for your poor folly faces. Okay. Uh, <laughs> somebody's asking about the project, but I'd rather keep that for tomorrow if we could. I know you haven't asked many questions, but um, I don't know, it's kind of hard even when teaching to come out of the meditation and start thinking about projects. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll try and think about that a bit tomorrow. Because it's not really obvious to me. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you like the talk, Samantha. Okay, uh, all right. I believe my strongest experiences in meditation have something to do with the process of sleeping or the time when I'm about to fall asleep. And according to my crazy experience of disappearing, it was as if all my aggregates were sleeping, but the mind consciousness, instead of following them, remained awake. So it's as if you must find a way to let go of the body and the thinking mind and let the body and the thinking mind go to bed, but on the other hand, preserve the mind consciousness awake. <laughs> Chaining a non-interfering mindfulness. Yeah, I like that idea. If your mind consciousness was awake in the meantime, what would it see? But it is awake, right? Anyway, may I ask your opinion about the relation that seems to exist between meditation and sleep. <clears throat> okay. Well, I mean, there is a place in the suttas where one of the Buddha's chief disciples, the Venerable Ananda, his attendant for 45 years, actually did work really, really hard to, uh, to meditate and to basically uh, experience the third three stages of enlightenment, the last three stages of enlightenment. It's a bit of a strange story because obviously he knew what to do. He was already a stream winner. So in that sense, he was already very wise, but still he was working really, really hard and meditating, you know, throughout the whole day and most of the night, I think, to, uh, to go deeper because he had to appear at the first council with 500 fully enlightened beings. Um, and he wasn't fully enlightened yet. The Venerable Ananda is the one that, um, memorized all of the Buddha's teachings because he was around him night and day and his sort of deal with the Buddha was that he'd be his attendant as long as he would never miss a single teaching and if he would miss one then he asked the Buddha to come and repeat it to him afterwards <laughs> so he was extremely uh, of great service to the Buddha and also extremely uh, knowledgeable uh, in all the suttas and had this amazing memory so anyway he knew what he was doing but somehow he was working too hard and then having developed that very, very strong mindfulness, he suddenly realized it's time to go to sleep. So he went to lay down on the bed, sort of accepting that, okay, well, I didn't become fully enlightened, but never mind. So there was a sense of relaxation, which came after that really diligent practice. So finally he started to relax and he actually was moving his head towards the pillow and the legend goes that he then became fully enlightened. So it may well be that in that particular case, there was something related to that sense of not yet sleeping, but using the mind as if it were to sleep. In other words, letting go, accepting and relaxing completely without any craving or wanting in the mind. So in that sense, there might be a slight relationship. I mean, I think the relationship is probably to do with that relaxation. Um, but you're quite right about how in meditation we have to almost like allow the other ones to sleep or to turn right down as it were but the mind has to remain awake and the problem often with meditators is that the um, so-called doer might start to disappear and stop and get sort of sleepy and forget its role, role. it might get out of the way but also the knower goes to sleep at the same time. <laughs> so just as you're about to kind of, you know, stop doing and you're getting quite peaceful, it's like the knowing mind is also 
uh, falling asleep. That's the common thing with sleep. In meditation, the knowing mind doesn't fall asleep. It has to stay awake. So it is as though it becomes very, very energized. It's as if the energy that was going into doing things um, starts to go into the knowing instead. I mean, this knowing is not a being, right? It's not a permanent thing, but it's a kind of process of knowing. So the mindfulness wakes up. So yeah, you could say it's a non-interfering mindfulness and it becomes powerful precisely because the doer has so-called gone to sleep. And the way that doer usually goes to sleep and starts to back off is when you're enjoying your meditation. So when you can like realize that that peace is arising, that bliss is arising precisely because you're not interfering, then there's an incentive to stop interfering. Yeah. The problem also can happen though, that um, if it's not quite gone to sleep, so to speak, when the bliss starts to arise, this doer comes back and goes, oh, let me have a look. Let me hold it. Let me, oh, what's going on? It, I call it sticky fingers. It might be Ajahn Brown that called it that, but these days I honestly forget. <laughs> so brainwashed. So in a good way. But um, I saw it like that in my own mind sometimes, you know, there's this bliss happening and everything's getting nice and it's because the doers backed off completely but not quite and so the bliss comes and my mind's a very curious very inquiring mind it's much more on the wisdom side I would say it's very very analytical so it wants to know what's happening and it wants to be there to experience what's happening so this little sticky fingers come in and sort of hmm. <laughs> it's not even verbal at that stage it's just like a slight wanting to be there uh, and then it's amazing that the bliss recedes but then if you know you're aware enough and you know what you've done you let go again of the doing and the bliss comes back so it's really interesting I find this process quite interesting so I think that's something similar to what you might be saying okay when experiencing Banganyana state, is this the part of the first jhana? Ha, huh, interesting question, because this is, um, obviously you understand that I've done a lot of Vipassana practice, so I'll be familiar with this Banganyana. Um, and there's in the, Abhid it's sort of in the Abhidhamma, I think, but it's also like the way that um, the teachers in Burma talk about the stages of insight. So basically in the beginning, you experience sensations, just sensations, like how it feels, is it pleasant, neutral? After a while, you start to understand the arising and passing. So you're actually using perception in a way that notices very, very clearly all the very small it's like particles or vibrations you're seeing it all like oscillate arise and pass arise and pass and the banganyana state is when the passing is more quick is more noticeable than the arising so everything feels like it's just like sandbanks just falling 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 like faster than it can possibly build up it's like everything's like sand just slipping away from the side of a of a bank basically is the only way i can I'm going to describe it. Everything's falling away. Like everything in the body feels extremely ethereal and like substanceless. There's nothing solid at all. Um, and it's not really part of the first jhana, although there is a strong samadhi that along with it, because you're so engaged with every small, tiny moment of that state that um, the continuity of awareness is extremely strong. So it's definitely a type of sustained awareness. But my understanding is that because the object is an object that's moving, and that's what's meant by Kanika Samadhi, not um, that the Samadhi is momentary, but the object is momentary. The Samadhi is very stable, but it's not going to get you into a jhana, a proper Samadhi jhana. <laughs> it's a very strong kind of sustained awareness and a kind of Samadhi for sure which some teachers say is equal or equivalent to the jhana, or at least to upachara, so jhana, like just before jhana. But it's not going to get you into the jhana proper because the object is unstable, it's unstable. This is what I've understood from teachers like Shaila Catherine and my other teacher, Bhante Ujagara, who is someone who's practiced the Pa'ak method all the way through very, very high um, levels of practice. And uh, so he's practiced the Samadhi states and uh, also the deep insight states through that, a similar method. Yeah, through a similar method. So I don't think it really matters if it is or not, but, but the jhana states that we're teaching here, that Ajahn Brahm's um, 
you know, I would say constitute his main vehicle into the deep insights. Um, they are quite different in that they are starting, they, they deliberately overlook change at that stage. Like you're actually mm, resting the mind on the stable part of the experience, on the thing that isn't changing. So you're trying to still the mind very, very deeply. So it appears that this light is not moving. For example, the first time I was seeing a light was actually in a Vipassana and the light was also arising and passing, like not going, it was like a sheet, but it was like in it was oscillation because my perception was primed to see impermanence. <laughs> so, and that is, I mean, depends who you talk to as a teacher, but I don't think that's the same as the kind of still limiters that we're talking about here. So I don't know, I hope that's not confusing everybody because we are talking about slightly a method that isn't being taught here, um, but it's all good basically because it's all leading to the same place. And as long as you know, you're focusing on impermanence, non-self, suffering, and also stilling the mind, calming the mind, and basically dissolving those hindrances, then, you know, the path is going in the right direction. So some people are more wisdom, uh, on the wisdom side, other people are more on the samadhi side in the sense they have a natural inclination to jhana kind of practice. Others that might come later, and the wisdom will, or for others, the wisdom, yeah, and the wisdom will come later for some. So it depends from person to person, which is why we can never really measure or judge our practice or compare ourselves to anyone else. It's completely purposeless. Oh gosh, now I've got loads of messages. <laughs> okay. My girlfriend is not feeling well and I joined her today, coughing, sneezing and aching. Oh, you mean you also feel bad today? Can I kindly ask anybody with genuine loving kindness to send a bit of it to us today? Of course. Adrian Stobrin. So Adrian's here and I don't know about others, but I'm going to look for you. Don't feel shy. But if I have your face and mine, then I shall be able to send it better. Okay, great. I see you. Yes, I know you because I've been looking at all your faces all the time. <laughs> so Meta will be coming and I will visualize your face later and send it to you and your girlfriend. And uh, don't worry. I really hope that you get better soon sickness is also a great teacher okay as long as you can use it to learn even more deeply how to be kind how to make peace and how not to wish it away because these things will go in their own time there's no need to wish it to go so in the meantime you can get to know its nature and get to know that it doesn't really affect your inner happiness oops okay hang on uh Okay, thank you for this systemic guided meditation. I finally understand what it's like to let go of the body. Thank you. Oh, lovely. And a very deep and good Dhamma talk. <laughs> thank you. Good. Well, you're thanking me, but yes, I'm very happy that that landed. Where in the body is the gentlest place to be with the breath? Well, the very gentlest place to be with the breath is just in the mind. So to not really locate it in the body. Um, in the Vipassana tradition, I used to locate my breath, like we were told specifically to locate it underneath the nose. So like on the area of the upper lip. And actually, if you do that long enough, you just feel loads and loads of sensations in the upper lip. And at that point, because of the Vipassana practice, you just learn to feel them arising and passing. And at that point, you're not really aware of the breath actually. And I started to realize this after years of practice that my Anapana and Vipassana was basically the same and that there was no real difference. And then I thought, hang on a minute, how can I just be with breath then if all I ever feel is this arising and passing? So I actually found it not very helpful then when I wanted to practice Samadhi Samadhi just with the breath as the object, because my teacher Ujagara told me I have to learn to um, experience the breath as breath, not as sensations, not as arising and passing, but as breath. And I couldn't understand what that meant for a long time. So I had to kind of take my awareness away from that place and just kind of get a very basic sense of in and out, in and out. And this entity 
you can even call it a concept of the breath because it's kind of a it, it felt to me like a much coarser reality than the one I'd been with before so it was kind of a bit strange to now go to a coarser meditation object but the point is that then that object becomes so smooth that you actually start to see stability there so it's what I talked about before that if you're always focusing on the change that's not an object that's going to get you into deep meditation you have to learn to be with something very very simple that starts to be very very the same all the time so it's almost like the in-breath and the out-breath becomes so smooth you can't tell the difference and then it just becomes this kind of almost like sometimes for me it becomes more like um a sort of cloud or piece of cotton wool or something and then this can be where nimittas begin uh, because that feeling of like it changing disappears it becomes a stable object so i would actually say the gentlest place is just to be aware of the mere occurrence of the breath and that's uh i think i picked that phrase up from shyla catherine another great jhana teacher who's also done a lot of vipassana practices specific practices um and she says, you know, notice the mere occurrence of the breath, the fact that the breath is coming in or going out, but you don't need to locate it anywhere in the body. If you feel it in the body, it doesn't matter, but you don't need to give that importance. It's like with every single object in the world, you can give importance to different aspects of it, either the color of it, the shape of it, the smell of it, whatever. Here, you're not giving attention to the location of it. You're giving attention to the breath itself. I hope that makes sense. So it's easier for people who haven't done Vipassana to do that because it took me about three years to get out of my arising passing perception and just feel the breath as a breath. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's okay. It's amazing how perception can get sort of conditioned a certain way. Okay, thank you for the teachings and beautiful meditations. I enjoy peace a lot of the time and then my, the mind goes again to the future on some projects or workshops I could do. My mind often goes there. It seems like restlessness. What is your advice to deal with that? The mind gets very excited and then goes on and on. Yeah, that's kind of normal. I wouldn't worry about that too much. I mean, this is only a seven day retreat, so it's wonderful that you have had a lot of peace. So I would focus on that and I wouldn't worry about the other stuff because that's going to be there probably for everyone. And um, especially as you come to the end of the retreat. So I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, you're right. It is a kind of restlessness. It's a kind of not being content with where you are. Or maybe it's that you've got a lot of energy in your mind as well. And you're not used to directing it to the peace. Because peace is quite subtle and the mind might be quite energetic. And it sort of wants an energetic object to like go to. I see that for myself sometimes on retreats. Like the mind gets bobbly. What you say, like, Ooh and then it wants to have like a little giggle with somebody instead of just being bobbly with the breath if that makes sense <laughs> it's almost like you have to fine tune the energy and just keep it on track um so it's really about developing more contentment uh but also not worrying too much like just let it do that but don't worry about it and don't give it too much importance because you also have peace I mean, I just wish that Ajahn Brahm, I asked him years ago, but I don't think it'll ever happen. I wish he would do like month long retreats. This would be really amazing. <laughs> you know, because then we have time to really go deep. And in my mind, if I'm busy in my daily life, my mind doesn't go quiet in seven days. It takes longer. I mean, it's quiet some of the time, but it doesn't like go completely quiet, you know, and never think about the future. So I don't know. Okay, so someone's sending a question. It's more like uh, sending a message of gratitude to Ajahn Brahm. Yes, indeed, I will uh, tell him that because that yesterday's talk meant a lot to somebody as if it were just for them. And this is one of the beauties of Ajahn Brahm's teachings. Apparently, somebody told me just before this one that the talk he gave this morning was for me and I'd had no idea. Well, I sort of knew, but yeah. Anyway, it was due to something that we talked about before the talk. And uh, and that it was clearly speaking to me, and uh, everyone feels like that. This is the amazing thing about a good dharma teacher. They sort of you don't always feel it every time, but there'll always be something there that speaks to you, and it's almost as if it spoke to you. 
it's just the magic of the Dhamma. So yes, I'm very glad that you receive purity, love, and love of the Dhamma from Ajahn Brown. That's wonderful because there's plenty of it there. <laughs> so yes, I will pass on that message. Uh -huh. Due to sexism, girls are identified with their bodies so heavily from a very young age, it's gotten more extreme with social media. As a monastic woman, do you have any insights? Hmm. I do think it's true that we internalize, you know, the toxic elements of the patriarchy, but all of us do actually, not only girls, We're, we all have internalized patriarchy. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not hanging around a lot of young girls, although I do have a niece who has grown considerably in the two years that I haven't seen her. Um, and she probably is starting to bother about how she looks but I'm not so sure it's different from my nephew to be honest because he's also very very sensitive if you say anything that could be seen as uh, you know I don't know anything like he's quite a tall really tall for his age and so sometimes people say he's a big boy and then he gets very upset because he thinks that means he's fat you know so I'm really not sure if it's very different for boys or girls it might depend on how sensitive someone is but certainly if the girls are like feeling they need to look a certain way, then this is absolutely conditioned by the media images that they see and the representation of the feminine and how a feminine is supposed to look. And, you know, but I think it's both, isn't it? I mean, this is all a side of the patriarchy that we live in that wants to sort of, I don't know, almost have a very dualistic idea of sexuality. Like, But the fact is that we're all somewhere on a spectrum. Gender's not a... A binary thing you know we're all on a spectrum we have the masculine and the feminine within us all um so yeah it's very difficult to give any advice on that the insights i guess that it is all conditioned that it's nothing to do with girls i mean you've realized that by your question um it's nothing to do with anything intrinsic in one gender or another it's just what we're being fed <laughs> and so I guess to have different role models as well is one of the reasons that it is kind of cool to be a nun because I actually think we're seen as far less cool than monks like it's very cool to be a monk right everybody thinks it's really cool there's always stories about forest monks and the wise old monk when do you ever hear the wise old nun the forest nun it's just not really in our in our like history or in our books it's always the forest monk the tough monk who can like has laser eyes and all this big monk stuff and uh, and this is you know it's not seen as cool to be a nun it's seen as like oh you're a woman why didn't you want to have children and um you know is there something wrong have you got a broken heart I mean I think this is even in the west it's definitely very 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 loud in um countries like Thailand and Burma I can't speak for all Asian countries but those two I've lived in especially Burma Actually, Burma's not too bad, but Thailand, it's, yeah, there's this idea of nuns are people with broken hearts. <laughs> you know, we couldn't, we failed in love or, <laughs> you know, covered how to cold heart because we don't want children. And as a woman, you should want children. And uh, so that's why you became a nun. Whereas a monk, it's like, wow, a monk's really cool. They don't need to have, you know, a woman. And <laughs> so there is that ridiculous difference in perception but actually it's great to have female monastics and to I mean maybe my character's like that but I also intentionally try to make myself quite accessible and approachable and human because I think people need those to identify with and, and people um, females representing um, spiritual practitioners right uh, monastic practitioners as well so that people know what it looks like I mean, how many nuns do you know? There are two of us here, actually. Hello, Venerable Dhamma Dinner. <laughs> and you're a very beautiful nun, although we've not met, but I'd love to meet you. <laughs> but it's lovely to see other um, female monastics because it shows that there are all kinds of characters and there are all kinds of reasons as well that people go forth. Um, and we're all very different, you know, and that's wonderful. So anyway. I don't know if I really answered that question. It is kind of worrying and it's hard to give advice because we can't really tell them not to be on social media these days, you know? But I guess too, if you do have a child as a young age, 
just notice your own language, you know, because I notice in my family and I hope they're not listening, but it does tend to be that, you know, girls get praised for how they look a lot. Oh, you look so lovely, clothes and your beauty. And um, boys, it's actually not so much in my family, but, you know, it's quite common. And I've read some, um, you know, feminist articles and stuff, so-called feminist, it's just equalist really, um, that say that boys are more likely to be praised for what they do and girls are more likely to be praised for how they look or what they are inside. So it directs a woman's attention or female's attention inward and a boy's outward. And then, you know, if you don't fit that gender binary, right? If you're a member of the LGBTQIA plus or you're just, I don't know, you don't identify. So then you're bi and not bi, uh, gender non-binary. Um, yeah, it's very confusing, I think. But we actually need people like that precisely for that reason to challenge these binary ideas. Anyway, that was a long answer and probably a bit rambly, but I hope there was something of use. Because <laughs> uh, it's a reality. I mean, you can say, oh, the mind doesn't have gender, but the fact is that depending on the bodies we're born into and how that's perceived in society, it impacts our opportunities. It impacts so many things, our well-being, even our safety. So wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone did really understand that the, the mind has no gender and respected each other equally. I started to practice Vipassana with Goenka also, and it was very hard for me to switch to the knowing of the breath in the way of Ajahn Brahma. Ha, huh? okay, interesting. Yeah, so you understand my experience, yeah feels like going from a subtler reality to a coarser one at first but the thing is it just takes you in a different direction that ultimately will deepen the practice so I think it's great actually that you've done that because it can be difficult to change methods so to speak and I was with that practice I mean I must have done 60 odd retreats and the same with serving as well and lots of long retreats so it was really you know that was my sole practice for a long time Oh, <laughs> I love this. I'm reading this out. I'm the best example that nuns can be really cool. Thank you. <laughs> I don't usually read those messages, but that's great. Thank you. I'm very happy. <laughs> uh, not always cool. Sometimes I'm, sometimes I'm, I don't know. <laughs> I can't say hot because that's the wrong meaning. But, you know, I'm not always like chilled, let's say. But I'm just real. I'm just... I am what I am. In Sri Lanka, being a bhikkhuni has become quite cool these days. Yay! That's good. Lots of YouTube videos on girls becoming nuns. Yeah, girls might be becoming nuns, but when you ask, they're not becoming bhikkhunis, there's a difference. <laughs> because you can't become a bhikkhuni until you're, I think, 19 or 20 or 21. So they're becoming nuns, and there are lots of nuns in Sri Lanka, but there aren't that many bhikkhunis. There's a couple of thousand, which is not too bad. Um, it's very good for a Theravada country, um, which is wonderful, but they're not all having the full um, ordination, which means that not they don't have status, but they're not recognized as part of the Sangha in the same way as monks are, and therefore they don't have the same support from the society. And even the bhikkhunis, I don't think they get like identification cards as members of the Sangha, even though they are. And also that means they can't get like, for example, free bus rides and passports and all sorts of things. I'm not sure about passports because I'm not the expert, but there's still a massive, massive um, difference and a lot of discrimination towards female monastics. But that's good. It's great that videos are coming out because it's, as I said, very important for us to see ourselves represented. And um, I remember one time going down to Damaloka, which is Ajahn Brahm's city centre in Perth. And um, usually it's the monks who all go down to give the talks. And if you've noticed, at least three times a month, and if you're lucky, once a month, a nun goes down. But it's actually much more than that. It's almost, I think a nun goes down actually only three or four times a year. Anyway, that's partly their choice, because Ajahn Brahm would like to see them more. But um, the monks are always sitting up there on the stage. And so one time when I was at Damasara, I wanted to go down <laughs> to the Friday night talk and about three other nuns decided to come with me. And uh, yeah, Renny's face is like, ooh, because she knows how rare that is. And we walked into the room 
And they all know there's nuns. They all know that there's a big Cuny monastery too. But there was almost like a silent kind of, everybody looked at us like we crawled out from under a stone, which we kind of had because the monastery is full of stones and rocks. Um, and they just were almost like, to see four nuns who looked all completely different, Sri Lankan nuns, Chinese nuns, me, um, you know, all completely different and with a certain aura, because you have a certain aura when you've been meditating a lot, there's a certain like peace that you're bringing with you, you're bringing the monastery, right? You're bringing your practice from the monastery into the city. And I could just feel like this. And then at the end of the talk, Ajahn Brahm was answering questions this side and then right next to him were Oz. And we got the same amount of people lining up to talk to us as he did. And I remember he left actually, and uh, he looked back at me and sort of smiled and said, very good, because he'd left and we still have people that were asking questions. And he was quite pleased about that. Um, so it just showed me that people do want to see uh, bikinis, but unfortunately here it's a bit hard because there's only me. And that means I can't be everywhere at once. So I get really kind of burned out because I'm doing too many jobs. There's not only me, I mean, there's Venerable here as well, but yeah, I mean, you're not out and about much, I think, these days. And uh, there were some other nuns in Amaravati, and uh, yeah, you write stuff. You're, you're online, yes? <laughs> we'll talk later anyways, but um, at Amaravati, there are lots of, lots of nuns, actually. But uh, yeah, again, you know, unless you actually visit those monasteries, you're not likely to see them very much. So... Okay, uh, what's this? Where did you sit my monks put us on the stage also? Oh, where did you sit? Um, your monks put you on the stage also, yeah. Um, Venerable Damodina, she lives in Oxford and the monks there are really supportive. They're Burmese monks and um, Sayadaw Damasami is the main monk, isn't he? But I think he's in Myanmar now. And he's wonderful. And he did tell me that he supports Bikunis quietly, he said um but he is very wonderful um and that's good yeah we also sat on the stage we did so in Perth they really are you know putting their actions where their mouth is so to speak so we even go in order now in the arms line at um Ajahn Brahm's monastery which is quite radical <laughs> believe it or not we go in the order of seniority rather than gender only I've not actually been there since that rule changed so I haven't had the privilege yet. <laughs> okay, there's one more question and I'm aware that it's a little late and maybe even a few of you have disappeared, but I'll feel free to disappear if you need to. There's one more thing which I'll address. Adrian Brown said something about bikinis having to keep more rules than monks. Curious about what those are and why. Thank you. That is quite a big question and I can't immediately off the top of my head answer all the different ones. Um, most of the rules come about because of specific incidents that happened in the Buddha's day and then the rule arose in a response. So they were more like, it's almost like um, descriptive of what was happening at the time. But there are some that might be a little bit more uh, scrupulous for nuns, uh, which is not perhaps, some people interpret it as much stricter like the, the really serious rules that we could easily, that we could break are a lot easier to break for a non, but actually when good scholars look at those and look at the meaning in which they were laid down, they find that it's not that way at all. So it's really interesting how, you know, the sort of sexism has crept in even to our interpretation of these rules. And if you look at it through more scholarly critical eyes and also doing cross, um, references with the Chinese canon, uh, you realize that some of it might have been changed, you know, since the Buddha's day. So it's not that significant, I don't think. So it's not, I mean, to me, it's not very significant. It's more about how we interpret and understand the meaning of the Vinaya, which is again, a restraint to help the wholesome qualities increase and the unwholesome ones decrease. So I think that's enough for tonight and thank you very much for your interesting and thoughtful and uh, sincere questions. It's really a privilege to be of service and it's lovely to sit with you. I unfortunately couldn't get to the group sit again, but there will be other times. So good night and tomorrow we'll have another chance to meet. Good night, good night.